Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a new discovery coming from Australia and also the idea of seeing things in radio waves. Let's talk about this and welcome to the Math. So today, if you were to go um, into a very, very dark location somewhere on our planet Earth, and if you were to look into the night skies, you might get lucky and see the super famous Milky Way. It looks something like this, um, and essentially it's the center and I guess the plane of our galaxy. It's a very beautiful sight if you ever get to see it, and in real life does give you the sense of awe and um, makes you feel really small. Now, this is what it looks like in visual light, basically the light that we can see. But what if we looked at it in a different frequency, for example, radio waves? Now, this is exactly what the recent research did. The researchers, whose paper you can find in the description below, or actually several papers, use this beautiful formation here that's known as Murchison White Field Array to observe our galaxy in radio waves. These are actually radio um, observatories, radio antennas in a sense, that um, work exactly like a telescope, but it's a radio telescope. And they created this beautiful map of the entire night skies that um, you can actually find by either reading their paper or more interestingly by going to this beautiful website that I really, really like visiting. And this is known as the so-called Gleam Survey. And this whole website is basically this. It's a map of the uh, night skies. It's what you see in the night skies, but you can then change the perspective by using different frequencies. Now, before I show you more, uh, let's briefly talk about the reasons why it might be important. So here in the solar system, everything revolves around our sun and even the properties of our sun are really important in, um, well, basically making the life a certain way on planet Earth. If you were to look at how our sun produces light and what type of light it produces, you would actually quickly realize that the vast majority of all of the radiation our sun makes is in the so-called visible light. Basically this, the stuff that's very familiar to us. All of the colors are formed by our sun right here and this is the peak of its uh, radiation. Everything else, like the ultraviolet and the radio waves and the UV light, is much, much, much less prominent. The majority of energy that our sun produces is visual, which is why it's sort of expected for life on various planets in the solar system to uh, mostly be oriented around vision. And it's also probably why the most successful species on our planet are you and me, basically humans. Essentially, the visual light created um, creatures that are able to perceive this light and use it to learn everything about the world around them. And uh, visually, we are some of the most advanced species, not in terms of the sensitivity to light, but in the way that we recreate the world around us using various levels of visual cortex inside our brain. Because if you've taken biology, you probably still remember that when the light comes into your eyes, it then is transferred via signals to the back of your head. This is your visual cortex. And it's actually really, really big and really complex. It has several levels of processing and each level is responsible for a certain thing. And humans have one of the, if not the most complex visual cortex, which is why we learn so well to create so much out of it. So basically, this right here is one of the main reasons we are so successful. But this comes from our sun. So naturally, if you were to live around a star that's not really big on visual light, let's just say it's bigger on infrared, like most of the red dwarfs, for example, like Trappist-1, or more so these objects. This is what's known as a brown dwarf. And the closest one to us is known as Loman A and Loman B. Both of these objects produce a lot of um, infrared light. They're very, very bright in infrared, but they produce almost no visual light. They're very, very dim. As a matter of fact, that's probably what they look like in real life, exceptionally dark. Now, there are also obviously stars that are way, way more powerful than our sun, like this blue sequence star known as Arcanar. And these stars produce a lot of ultraviolet and some even produce X-rays. 
So there's definitely um, different types of star systems with different spectrum being the major component. And in these star systems, naturally you'd expect if there is any life, it would probably use that spectrum to find a way to learn about the world and to communicate. All right, so that was a really big tangent. And now we're back to this, this beautiful image that you can find in the description below. Here, this is the visual light. Now look at what you would see in the x-rays. This is what the world would look like to you if you were to see it in x-ray vision. So if there are aliens that specialize in x-ray uh, reception and processing of information, this is their world. There's even gamma ray, which looks even more extreme. This is uh, something that you would only see if you're able to detect the highest type of energy. And then we have infrared, which is on the opposite side. And this is the most exciting because that's how we see some of the darker objects like nearby planets that are usually too dark to see otherwise in visual light. And um, basically pretty much most of the major objects that emit any heat will produce a lot of infrared. Then we have microwave. This is what all of this looks like in microwave radiation. And lastly, the radio light. So um, if we were to go back to the visible light, this is the center of the Milky Way. Here you can see the large Magellanic Cloud. Suddenly, if we change this to radio waves, you see a completely different world. And the papers that I mentioned in the beginning essentially did that. They analyzed, um, thoroughly analyzed the radio waves. And you'll notice that the world does look a little bit different. Like for example, this becomes extremely prominent. I've talked about this in one of the previous videos, actually several previous videos. You might already know what this is. This is one of the closest and the brightest radio objects to us, the galaxy known as Centaurus A, which sort of looks like this, although these parts are the radio waves. You're not actually going to see them in visual light. So technically what you're looking at here is a composite image of several different frequencies. In visual light, this galaxy sort of looks like this. You're not going to see the radio formations and the actual jets that emit a lot of radio frequencies unless you use radio telescope. And so by looking at the skies in radio waves and by using a supercomputer in Australia, the scientists behind this paper discovered at least 27 new objects that represent what are known as stellar remnants. Basically, leftovers from really large supernova that are still emitting a lot of radio waves. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see them here because this is a slightly more outdated version, but they have provided the more updated picture right here and also in their paper. And here's what these 27 massive remnants look like. All of these were results of supernova in the last 9,000 years or so. And some of these were in really peculiar locations, either really far away or in completely empty spaces. And previously we've already discovered about 300 different remnants in our galaxy. So discovering 27 is basically increasing the number of discoveries by about 10%. And because some of these were basically where nothing else is, essentially just empty space devoid of any other stars, it made the discovery a little bit more unusual. And one of these discoveries was even above the galactic plane, in the middle of the intergalactic space. So that makes it very strange and very unusual and will very likely result in more studies trying to figure out how that um, neutron star or black hole got there. Now, because this study was done in Australia and using Australian equipment, the scientists also thought that it would be a good idea to actually consult with the um, local Aboriginal uh, communities. Now, you might have never heard of Australian Aboriginals, but they're one of the most preserved communities in the world, in the sense that their culture is about 50,000 years old and has not been touched by the outside world for that long. And they also have an extremely rich oral tradition of legends and stories from basically thousands and thousands of years ago. And the scientists behind this paper believe that there's got to be at least a few stories that are going to tell us about sudden flashes in the skies that were essentially supernova and those flashes probably created one of these remnants. Now, having read about various uh, Aboriginal stories, I remember reading about this specific crater somewhere in the desert of Australia that actually did have an unusual story around it. And from what I remember, the really large crater that formed several thousand years ago had a story associated with it that involved something formed from the skies. Although in their stories, it was actually a child and the parents that lived in the stars were extremely sad about it. 
And turns out that in their stories, there was also a warning against coming toward or close to the creator because you could get sick. And when I read this, it made me uh, kind of wonder, does that mean that maybe this does sort of represent the reality of what may have happened thousands of years ago? There was a somewhat large collision that was seen from everywhere. When people went there, there was probably a lot of dust and a lot of various material circulating that could technically get you sick. And their interpretation of all of this was that it was God's trying to punish them. So I'm kind of looking forward to possibly reading more about this and maybe the scientists behind this paper will be able to discover some kind of a legend that relates to one of the supernova that happened in the last 9,000 years. Now other than that, that's pretty much it about the discovery and the creation of this beautiful radio map. And once we discover more, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't and share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Maybe consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.